All right, so today we're talking about anthropomorphic design, making WordPress better with jazz hands. Awesome. I'm in the right place. Exactly. Actually, no, we're not. We're talking about HyperDB, MySQL, performance, and the flavors of MySQL. Uh, I'm a data engineer, which basically means a DBA that does MapReduce and also is afraid of Apache Zookeeper. Uh, I worked with WordPress for about five years and know more about MySQL than I'd care to uh, admit. It's, it's, we have a long, long history. Uh, disclaimers, I believe that Google exists, that you can use it, that you probably don't want to read a bunch of code snippets, and more than anything else, you're probably looking to just sort of get an idea, what are the questions that should be asking in the first place? Probably none of you are DBAs, and for that matter, I've talked to some of you earlier, and you don't want to be DBAs, and that's fine. But it, in the very least, I'm hoping that uh, I can sort of level up sort of which questions you should be asking in the first place. That's really more of my, uh, my goal today. And also to uh, raise the level of cowbell in WordPress, because I think that's obvious. It needs it. What is HyperDB? It is a very advanced database class. I have no idea what that means, actually. Uh, it supports replication, partitioning, load balancing, et cetera. And by very advanced database class, this maybe should make you wonder, like, what are they talking about? All right, if I just count the number of lines of PHP in these different uh, plugins, HyperDB weighs in about 1,400 lines of code. WordPress itself, 255,000. Uh, Hello Dolly at 81. I mean, if you guys know what that plugin does, I think we can all conclude that Matt Mullenweg must write really crap PHP or something. <laughs> and uh, not really. Uh, and then, you know, this is the, just for reference. I mean, Yoast Google Analytics, not the full blown Yoast plugin, but just the one that literally adds a Google Analytics uh, button, I guess, to your website. And I think it does something else, like pulls metrics in. But that's 16,000 lines of code. So this is a horrible way to figure out complexity or even you know, how complicated something is. I mean, obviously, this is not how many lines of code did you write. That's a terrible productivity metric. It's a terrible way to say this is advanced or this is not. But it, in the very least, should probably suggest that what's complicated about HyperDB isn't actually the code itself. And it's really not. It's you know, working with HyperDB. Uh, is a lot like working with wp-config. You're going to you know, move a couple things here and there, <laughs> specify some host names, some settings, et cetera. But it's really kind of like a glorified wp-config. Uh, what does that mean for us? Why do we care? Well, it means that, A, we need to understand MySQL. Well, this is a WordPress conference, and what the heck do we care about MySQL? My argument on this would be that, um, you guys know Tom McFarland? Did, you, did anybody go to his talk yesterday? Cool. Um, so he posted something a little while ago, this article about why WordPress salaries are so low. And the, sort of the three bullet points or the three opinions he walked away with. One, um, people really aren't familiar with what WordPress can do. I don't know if you guys have any experience with that or you know, you've talked to somebody and thought, oh, well, WordPress is, WordPress is just a blogging platform, for example. I've heard this a hundred times. I'm sure you guys have as well. Uh, personally, I think you can do a lot more than that. Um, but this is certainly something that you run into. Part of it, I think, also relates to the fact that uh, it's really easy in WordPress to be a software implementer, not a word, uh, software developer, which is very, very common. Uh, and then I think also we as a whole in the WordPress community have not really done a great job educating uh, employers, customers, software implementers, et cetera, what WordPress actually can do in the first place. Um, so. Point being, yeah, maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to our database. What it can do for us, if we don't want WordPress to just be a blog, or if we don't want WordPress to just be this sort of, you know, mini development kind of, you're not really developer sort of, we need to start paying attention to some of the other tools in our stack, MySQL being one of them. So again, uh, you know, more into what exactly I'm saying by that, I think we don't need any more social media icons, guys. Like literally, we need that about like app, the App Store needs Spark apps. You know, it's just, we've got enough. Uh, and the things that are really pushing the WordPress envelope, they're pretty much all database specific. Uh, membership sites, uh, Brian Crossgard, am I pronouncing his name correctly? Uh, he was talking about membership sites yesterday. These are extremely database intensive as a rule. Uh, if you've ever done anything with e-commerce solutions in WordPress, they're extremely database intensive as a rule. Uh, BuddyPress, the forum plugin, BBPress, they're all very, very heavy in your database. And you kind of need to understand some of your fundamentals. Uh, in order to really use them. But you also, if you're going to try to create something that pushes the envelope of what WordPress can do or is doing, odds are pretty good you're going to run into the database before very long. In fact, I was talking to a gentleman over here earlier who had some pretty interesting ideas about how WordPress could be used uh, with Angular or with other technologies in the stack. And he's you know, running into some questions about how do I make this scale? How do I make this high availability and so forth? 
So if you want to do really cool stuff with WordPress, you got to pay attention to the database. That's my second argument. HyperDB, for practical and and purposes, it's just WP config. I already said that. No need to say it again. And if you want to figure out how to install it, the DigitalOcean article, literally, it's, it can do better than I can do in this entire presentation. It's a really good article. You should read it if you're interested in setting it up. If you're not interested in just figuring out, you know, how do I set this up, maybe you're interested in understanding what it actually is doing. And that's where, this is where I'm going to spend a little bit more time. I've been sort of flying through some of this so far. I want to spend a bit more time here. How many of us are familiar with replication in MySQL? How many are not? Let me go with that instead. How many are not? Are you seriously not familiar? Oh, that's interesting. Dude, I don't know any MySQL. Okay. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. Uh, partitioning. How many of us are not familiar with that, that concept? Okay. Uh, failover. Does that make sense? Everybody pretty comfortable? Load balancing. Okay. The people who are familiar with all of this stuff, by the way, if you're completely bored out of your minds, feel free. There's a great speech on roots, and I like to always caveat that. When I walk into a room, I have no idea the technical background of the people who are here. So I may have completely misjudged it, and if that's the case, don't, I will not be offended if you leave. And I think Julian's talk on roots is probably very good. Uh, and you can also throw tomatoes at me. I don't mind. Um, so in replication, what we're dealing with uh, is literally I've got this one database here. Typically, you'll have, I'm going to start with the simplest case, which is master to slave. And so there's this one database here that can accept reads and writes. And it's sort of your system of record. You know, if I create a new user, if I create a new page, this is the one, you know, database that's always going to be getting that new write. Then they'll have a slave database over here, which you typically create, you know, as a read-only database. And it's designed to just sort of share the load with the master database. And its job is literally just to stand there and read what's called the bin log off of the master and say, okay, I see that you did this, I see that you did this, let me make sure that I'm copying this stuff as well. Replication is uh, really pretty easy to set up uh, with, I believe it was Word for, uh, MySQL 5.5, they moved away from, it might have been 5.4, they moved away from statement-based replication to uh, row-based, which is way more reliable. You're actually, I've never seen replication not break given a long enough period of time. Uh, but you can actually go a week or two without running into a lot of replication errors now, whereas before it was like every day you were hitting replication errors. Uh, you can also set up more complicated systems like master, master, or uh, master, master, slave, slave. I mean, there's all kinds of other configurations that you could potentially do with MySQL and replication. But the, the general canonical rule is you're talking about master, slave, or master, slave, slave, et cetera. Uh, by the way, if anyone ever says that you should do multi-master replication, be very cautious about that. That's not actually a very good idea for most of the time. Just caveat that. And if you'd like to know why, by the way, please catch me afterwards or ask me in the question section. Uh, partitioning. Um, this is one of those things that will either really save your butt or it will kill you. I've never really seen it do anything in between that. Uh, the idea behind partitioning is there's two ways you can do it. One is you guys are all pretty familiar with the tables in WordPress itself, WP users and so forth. One way you can partition is you can say, all right, I'm going to put half of these tables over here and the other half of these tables on this other database. What could go wrong? <laughs> you, could, you could lose, uh, depending on your physical setup, you could, you could have uh, physical failure. Uh -huh. You could have uh, a logical failure. Or you have... So, so basically, the, what you're getting at is uh, hardware failure, right? You know, that, that's one risk. You, you now have two machines that could fail as opposed to just one. And literally half of your tables are running. That is certainly a true statement. There may be something way more obvious in this. Like fundamental, I think, in fact. Yes? I don't, I don't know if this is one, but um, if you're splitting a, a multi-site, a user might have access to what, multiple sites. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, if you did it wrong, but that's, that's not really the, do, I'm sorry? It would be pretty hard to do that. So the, the concern, if I understand it correctly, is that if I were to move uh, some of these tables, you know, in a, in a standard WordPress configuration from one database into like literally just split the tables in half, say, um, that would that somehow, you know, mess with the permissions inside of WordPress? Not probably in the way that you're thinking. I'm going to come back to actually. I need to make. What's that? It's going to look at the wrong database to find the table, and it's going to be messier. Well, no, in HyperDB, you can actually define which tables are located where, right? So in, in, the, in the partitioning, what's one of the things that HyperDB well, what, does? What are the, you asked what one of the concerns are that could possibly It could be looking at the wrong table. Absolutely. Guys, I need to actually take a step way back from this. Connect your, your connection problems? Yeah, keep going with that. Problems? Connection problems. What else? Okay. 
Think can about you latency. Clarify the question? I'm sorry? Can you clarify the question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what? Split the tables in half. Do you mean having both? Having there's, both there's multiple, yes. There's multiple ways that you can handle replication. One of the ways, I'm probably leaving the camera right now. One of the ways, let's say I've got WP, I'm just going to stick it with two users, right? I've got WP users, and I've also got WP user meta, or whatever that table's called, right? Option one, maybe I put this in database A and this in database B. That's, that is technically rep, uh, partitioning, rather. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is I could say, all right, every ID that starts with an odd number, go to that table. If it's even, go to this table, right? But I, either way, we're still partitioning our data. Think about latency. You guys, have you ever seen this graph of, uh, you know, we all know, I'm assuming, memory is faster than disk. What about network? That's fast, right? <laughs> no, it's absolutely not fast. And so the, the odds of you creating a, uh, partitioning your data in a way that basically turns your bottleneck, you're no, you're, you're no longer dealing with, oh, my database is the bottleneck, you're gonna turn your network into a bottleneck. And this happens time and time and time and time and time and time again. It's especially common, by the way, if you were to move your WP users tables and so forth, if all of those are contained in one database and maybe your posts are in a different database, you might avoid a lot of those network latency issues for quite some time. What if you did something really stupid, like said, every user whose last name starts with S goes to database one. Every, you know, if it starts with the last name starts with a T, it goes to database two. If it starts with U, it goes here. V, here, right? You're literally defining your partition scheme based on the observations of the data itself. What would happen? Your index would suck. Yes, your index would suck. Why is that? Data distribution is not even, right? So basically you're hashing, you're partitioning your data based on a, you know, a non-consistent hash. Your last name. I don't know what you know, everybody's last name is, but I'm willing to bet that you know, not that many last names start with Z or with B. That's a very real problem. And this is something where, keep in mind, if you start thinking, oh, I need to partition my data, it's not easy to get it right. And it's so not easy to get it right that no SQL exists. That's just, you may need to do it. It's very entirely possible that you will need to partition your data at some point, but do not underestimate the complexity of that. It is very, 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 very difficult to get it right. Failover, I think that's a you know, pretty obvious statement what failover is, right? <coughs> My database goes down, okay, crap, read the other one. Make sense? Uh, load balancing, you know, I need to just go ahead and be explicit here. You can load balance your database or you can also load balance your web application. Uh, to be honest with you, before I would even consider load balancing my database, I would start with load balancing my app. Again, it's not 100% across the road, and I would actually evaluate the problem and see where I'm seeing latency issues in the first place, apply aggressive caching and so forth. But nine times out of 10, I don't really need to load balance my database as much as I need to manage connections to it. I need to terminate them quickly, Maybe I just need to have my workers on the front end doing a little bit more work for me, better caching, for example. Uh, performance basics. I'm just going to ask everybody to take a look at this slide, and are there any terms in here that you all, are you guys all familiar with these terms? Is anyone familiar with these terms? Two, three people. Okay. Yes or no? That was the question. My name went three. You're familiar with the terms. Do you, you guys know what these things mean? This, by the way, is what DBAs do all darn day. We literally stare at this and go, I wonder if I you know, flip my buffer pool a little bit higher, what would happen? And you know, so I was talking to this gentleman earlier that on a Saturday, you know, he picks up like React, JS, or Angular, or something like that. And DBAs, on the other hand, are the guys that read through system settings like this and we're incredibly boring people. Um, the performance base, I mean, the high level, the very first thing that you may want to do prior to calling a DBA, right? Or the very first thing that you should do if, if you do call a DBA and they start saying things, you're just trying to figure out, is what they're telling me actually true? Uh, if they start mentioning these things, it's a good chance they are. The NODB buffer pool size. Are you guys familiar with LRU? I mean anything at all? La least recently used is what it stands for. And so the idea behind least recently used is it's a cache. It's an in-memory cache system that is going to say, all right, keep evicting keys if they're not used as often. So if, you're, if I've got one you know, page on my website, for example, that's sitting in the cache, everybody comes to see that page, like for example, your home page. That's probably gonna be sitting in a cache somewhere, maybe a front end cache of some kind, but if you're, database, if you're only doing database caching, that's gonna be in your LRU cache for sure, because everybody visits that page. 
your obscure, you know, this is my, you know, PGP key in the bottom of my website, so that may not be quite as popular, and it's going to be more likely to get evicted from your cache. Uh, the buffer pool size is basically defining how much cache uh, you know, MySQL is allowed to use. And typically the setting that we go with is about 70 to 80% of your total RAM. That's assuming you don't have Apache sitting on this same server, by the way. If you do, you guys know what Oomkiller is, right? If not, <laughs> really? I would, I would almost, really? Okay, uh, out of memory killer. So it's this process that runs on, uh, on Linux. And it says, oh geez, I'm out, of, I'm out of memory. And it starts killing things. Pretty much without fail, it's going to kill MySQL every single time. It's not going to kill Apache. It's going to kill MySQL again and again and again and again. So if you go and switch your NODB, NODB buffer pool, especially if you're using Apache, 70 to 80% is a bit too aggressive, right? Put your MySQL somewhere else. Run that on its own server somewhere. Crank it up to 70 or 80% and you're fine. NODB, uh, NODB buffer pool instances. Uh, the idea behind this, you guys are familiar with threading, right? Multiprocessing versus multithreading, we're all familiar. Uh, the idea is that sometimes we'll run into bottlenecks with these threads, and if you just split the, your cache into two, the threads will have a little bit better, you'll run into less contention, fewer bottlenecks. So it's a pretty good way to, uh, to speed things up under certain circumstances. NRDB file per table. Guys, did you know this? If you, uh, if you delete, let's say you delete a bunch of transients from your WP settings, and um, these are completely make up numbers, but let's suppose that you're, is it WP settings or is it WP user settings? It's WP options, isn't it, where the transients are stored? Mm -hmm. WP options. Suppose you've got somebody who's gone crazy, they've had their website for 10 years, and all of a sudden there are, I don't know, 500,000 rows of transients. So let's say this entire database takes up about you know, 10 meg, or this particular table takes up 10 meg. And you go delete all those 500,000 transients. How much space did you free up? in MySQL on your server in general? None, zero, not a bit. The reason is because when you delete data from, in a, from MySQL, especially in NODB, you're not freeing up anything on the disk. It's still saving them in the bin log. If you actually want to get rid of it, you're going to have to, uh, to truncate your tables, potentially. You're going to have to restart MySQL, rebuild its indices. Uh, and the only way that that will even work for you is if you turn on this file per table. So I like to tell people, go ahead and turn on NODB file per table. It's set on the button default in 5.6. If you're, for whatever reason, using five, you know, something earlier than that, 5.55, turn it on, because otherwise you are completely out of luck when you need to save some space. Max connections, if you ever have a DBA that says you need to up that, be very skeptical. Uh, you should probably check your PHP first. Uh, this is all incredibly boring. I can look around the, uh, the crowd and I can see that people are sort of glazing over on their eyes. So I'm just going to actually skip the log bin. Slow query log, we are roughly familiar with how that works. It's not turned on by default. Uh, turn it on. And also every, every uh, couple months maybe, Set the, the slow query time to zero. Logs things for a day or two, see what happens. And in particular, um, analyze the slow query log. Uh, are you guys familiar with Percona Toolkit? Anyone? Now. Now? <laughs> yeah. Since yeah. so two hours ago. <laughs> What's that? As of two hours ago, exactly. Uh, if, you, if you use, if you spend, like, all of this stuff only matters if you have a VPS or dedicated server, right? You're not going to go on to you know, GoDaddy or whoever or any managed host of any kind and start running this stuff. You're not like, I want to use MariaDB instead. They're going to tell you no. So I'm assuming you've got a VPS or something that you can actually shell into and install software. If you do and you're not using Percona Toolkit, I really don't understand why not. I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful tool. Uh, and let me go ahead and flip ahead. This little PT Query Digest, that little one statement will go and analyze all of my queries for the last, uh, since November 2014, uh, and it'll give me this nice little output that looks sort of like, is that actually showing up by the way? Yeah. Cool. It'll give me some output that looks very difficult to read on this screen. But it'll tell me, okay, these were the, you can't even read it. Yeah, that's horrible, I apologize. Well, what it's gonna do is it's gonna analyze your slow queries and tell you where you're spending all your time. You know, how many queries are being called, how often they're being called, uh, which ones are slow, what percentage are slow, which ones are resulting in a, in a temp create table creation, which ones are, uh, are doing full table scans. Brilliant, brilliant tool that I highly recommend using. Um, best practices in MySQL and just in general, uh, monitor everything. 
I mean, literally hook up New Relic, Datadog's Addicts, Graphite, anything you can think of, keep track of what's going on. If you're old school and you want to use like a Nagios monitoring system, by all means, but monitor your system. Absolutely keep a track on what's going on. Uh, I mentioned this one slide here. This is a pretty interesting way to, uh, to keep track of metrics on MySQL. Uh, so just specifically, if you guys are into StatsD and Graphite, uh, that's a pretty interesting article. Analyze your queries. Uh, you know, use MySQL dump slow. Use Pertona, per, the Percona toolkit, the PT Query Digest. Uh, there's some plugins actually that do this. For example, uh, New Relic has a MySQL plugin that will actually analyze which queries are spending most of your you're spending most of your time on. Use them. Um, do you guys know what the query execution plan is? When you write explain in front of a query, yeah. One important caveat, uh, it's not 100% accurate. Like this is it, what it's going to tell you is what MySQL thinks it's going to do. It may do something completely different. In fact, it's, there's sort of well-known ways to trick it. Um, but it's a good idea to understand what this query execution plan looks like. That's sort of your first line of defense when a guy like me, a DBA, says, you're writing really bad queries. This is probably what we're looking at, and this is probably what we're referring to. So know how to reason about it yourself. Uh, and then schedule DB maintenance. This should be obvious, but people fail to do it all the time. Um, there are a couple different flavors of MySQL. This I'm going to sort of gloss over as well. As I can tell, I'm also putting everyone to sleep. DBAs do that. Uh, the, uh, there's MySQL, of course. Uh, when MySQL was purchased by Oracle, MariaDB, uh, the guys that built MySQL in the first place, actually forked it. And they said, all right, fine. We don't want Oracle's involvement in this. We're going to build our own. And uh, Automatic is an official, I think an official, uh, sponsor of MariaDB. I don't exactly know if that's a monetary support. I don't know what the arrangement is, but I know that they are one of the official sponsors of Maria. And then there's Percona. Um, Percona is very similar to MariaDB. Uh, in personal opinion, I think you can fine tune Percona a little bit more. If you're really doing database intensive stuff, I'd probably lead, lean towards Percona. Um, if you're just trying to get you know, better MySQL out of the box, it's pretty hard to, Mar to beat MariaDB. Um, a couple special mentions. Again, of course, Percona Toolkit. I cannot recommend highly enough that you install this on your server and that you start using it. It's beautiful. Uh, I also cannot recommend, this is completely tangential, but Nginx, like, if you're not using it, I don't understand why. I really, really don't. I know there was a talk earlier about uh, the stacks. I don't actually know who won. I was... Apache and HHVM. That's interesting. Okay. By well, HHVM, I didn't even... yeah. what's, what's that? By a very small margin. Yeah. Okay. How much tuning was involved in that? Uh, Nginx was uh, stock, and Apache had max request workers, too. Okay. So very, very little. Gotcha. Got... Was that your stock? <coughs> yeah. Okay. I... That may be a very, I'm not as familiar with HHVM, but uh, definitely I would not use straight out of the box Apache. I, it's, I've never had a lot of luck with it, and I've seen a lot of, especially if you've got MySQL and Apache sharing the same server, I've seen a lot of DBs go down because of Unkiller. Uh, I would really strongly recommend something with asynchronous workers, which I believe HHVM does have. I don't actually recall. Not so much. Talk to the uh, stacks guy. Does asynchronous now. Uh, okay. Nginx has that in for a long. Fair enough. Uh, and then another thing um, that I, I mean, this is a boring topic. I mean, obviously, who wants to be a DBA? These, these are the guys that you stick in the basement, you forget that they exist. But at the same time, yeah, exactly, and now you see why. Uh, but at the same time, you really should, I think, as, as a WordPress developer, uh, kind of get outside of that WordPress bubble a little bit. Go figure out what the DBAs are thinking about. Go think about... Um, what those Ruby guys are saying as developers. Because a lot of times I do think the, the overall quality, there are some brilliant, brilliant, brilliant WordPress developers. Several of them are here actually today. There's also, it's very easy to be a very mediocre developer in WordPress. It makes a lot of things very easy. Uh, I would recommend that you kind of get outside of that bubble. You know, learn about things that other people are talking about in Ruby, in Python. And a great example of where this kind of taking other ideas and applying them to WordPress. Uh, Roots, who Jill, uh, can't even remember, Julian is speaking about right now, took the 12-factor app. Are you guys familiar with that? Basically figure out how that could be applied to WordPress. Try to do some of those sorts of things. Be, even if it's you know boring, like learn about how databases work, you'll be a, de a better developer, and I think you'll make WordPress a lot better for it. Uh, with that being said, I appreciate your time, and you know, thank you for putting up with all this boring stuff. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And if, uh, if there's any tomatoes to be thrown, I'll stand somewhere 
a little bit easier to hit them. <laughs> exactly. So are there any questions? Yes? So when you were talking about the partitioning, yep. um, what would be the recommended way? So the question is, if uh, I was talking about partitioning, and what would I recommend? Um, there are, there's no, I'm not aware of any like hard and fast rules. Uh, partitioning, in my experience, there are certain problems that are very easy to solve with partitioning. In fact, GitHub has one. Um, GitHub is one of the largest uh, MySQL clusters in existence. It's in the top 20, I believe. Uh, and their data kind of lends itself towards partitioning. I can put all of these users over here and all of these users over here. And as long as each one of these servers has a sort of complete view of the universe, they don't have to deal with any of this network latency crap. It's a, it's a pretty nice problem to deal with. Um, if you're dealing with that problem where you can kind of isolate, where you can treat each server as its own little miniature universe that has all of the data it needs to answer whatever queries are coming to it, partitioning is fine. If that's not the problem that you're solving, I actually recommend that you don't even, you know, don't even try. Just move to a NoSQL solution at that point. An example of this, so I work in uh, advertiser analytics, and one of the things that we have to answer is who's advertising where? I can't, like, I've got publishers, networks, and advertisers, and I need to know basically which combinations are occurring and where. I can't really partition those data and answer that question because I need these advertisers to know about these publishers and so forth. If your data look like that, you've got to go to NoSQL, in my opinion. There's just no way around it. Yeah, but, um, and, and I was confused with the term partitioning. I always heard um, federation, mm -hmm. which is a similar mm -hmm. concept. But um, with WordPress, mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it true that uh, unless you're Condé Nast, you're probably not going to have to worry about partitioning WordPress? Absolutely. And, and if you get to that point, you've probably got enough money to hire a DBA who understands it. Absolutely. So the, the question was, is, are there really a lot of good use cases for, uh, for partitioning in WordPress? Uh, well, there's certainly one. I mean, WordPress.com, automatic. These guys are, are they have a very well-known use case. They're using HyperDB. Uh, most users, probably not. Um, and the reason that I mention this, and I mean, I, to be honest with you, I submitted two talk ideas, and this is the one that won. I was a little bit surprised because in, in point of fact, I mean, my recommendation with HyperDB is, there's probably a lot of things that you can do before using HyperDB that will really get you a long way. Um, that's why I didn't really touch on a lot of stuff in HyperDB specifically, because I think a lot of the stuff, you know, you probably would get a lot more mileage, uh, you know, upping your buffer pool, for example, or moving MySQL to its own server yeah. uh, using dedicated hardware. I mean, there's a there's a million things that you can do prior to needing to partition your data, especially with MySQL, and if you do. Um, you're going to have an interesting time. It, it's not an easy thing to, to get right. It's not an easy thing to, to do at all. Uh, fortunately, you probably never will have to. Yes. So. But, and, and, and I wasn't trying to contradict you. Um, my problem is I've see, it, it's very difficult to get it right. It's incredibly easy to get it wrong. And yes. I've seen people say, oh, I'm going to grow, so I need to go ahead and federate now. And no. um, that, to me, is the... I mean, I just, and that's... I, I I'm glad that... I my MySQL to its own droplet on DigitalOcean, and that did more for my um, WordPress performance than anything I've done since moving to PHP 5.6. So, so I, for the sake of the cameras, I need to go ahead and repeat what you just said, but the, the point that you're raising is exactly true. I mean, if you move MySQL to its own server, mm -hmm. uh, it can even be a cloud server, and nine times out of ten, that is all you need, especially for a WordPress site. Um, I... There are definitely cases where you do need to partition your data, even within MySQL. I'm sorry, within WordPress. They're not very common. And you probably will run into a lot of uh, other, I mean, aggressively cache everything you possibly can on the front end. Terminate those database connections as quickly as you possibly can. That's another thing that, I mean, as a DBA, the thing that I see most commonly from developers that just makes me want to scream, uh, terminate your connections, guys. You'd be surprised how many of these connections are sitting there for like, you know, 300 seconds, because PHP didn't terminate the connection. It's a very, very common thing, and that can tank your server pretty quickly. So I have three questions, it looks like, and I have absolutely no idea whose hand was up first. Uh, go so ahead. I, I, uh, hopefully mine's quick. Um, one thing that I hear a lot of people mentioning is that on a, a WordPress multi-site, uh, the standard is 2,000 sites per database, and uh, I guess it's just a standard, but uh, it's, I guess it's based on the load or how many people are, how heavy that, that uh, 
MySQL databases. There's no, there's no, so the question is, um, on a WordPress multi-site, is there some sort of hard and fast or specific line in the sand about 2,000 sites as opposed to 5,000 or 500? The answer is no. Uh, you do have to be mindful of the number of connections going to MySQL at any one point in time. Um, the default as of 5.6, I think it's 100 concurrent connections. Does anyone know off the top of their head? Uh, I've seen people take it as high as 1,000. Um, not very commonly. I guess the idea is kind of this, you should look at um, doing some separate analysis on your own and then make that uh, Yeah, decision. I mean, what we'll, for example, a multi-site, this is actually a really easy scenario where you could partition, right? I mean, if, if you're really running more than 2,000 sites uh, on a network, run two servers, not one. I mean, the, the odds of these connection problems would start leading to very real uh, performance degradation, pretty high. And that's certainly not something 2,000 users logging in blogging about whatever they're blogging about, it's hard for any database to maintain. Um, yeah, I mean, but there's definitely no line in the sand. That's, that's not a hard and fast, this is the law kind of number. I, I think that's your question, is that? Yeah, that, that's uh, that answer, thank you. Okay, uh, yes? So I have like three questions, but I'll do one and let the other person ask. Okay. Um, so, um, and I think maybe the problem was I came in just a little bit late. Um, we were all supposed so this guy stand, you know came in late. We we're all supposed to stand and point at this guy and make him feel bad for it. But since since you admitted it, I'll just make you feel bad now. <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, How dare you come late to my talk? <laughs> the HyperDB. Yes. It's not real clear what it does mm -hmm. and why you use it. Okay. Uh, Thank you for letting me know that. Um, so HyperDB, he's saying it's not very clear what it does and, and why you would use it. Um, HyperDB is, to be honest with you, it's really just a glorified WP config. All it's doing is letting you define, if, if you download the code and read through it, I mean, you'll literally be able to just use it. Uh, it's, it'll let you say, okay, I want my SQL servers to be, not my SQL, anyway. Uh, I wanted to point at this server and this server, and I want to you know, send 50% of my requests at this server and then 50% at this other server. Or I want to move table ABC to here and table DEF to here. And it just lets you define that sort of logic. It also lets you define you know, failover protocols. If this database goes down, use that one. Or this database is a master, read off of the slave, for example. It just literally lets you define the configuration of whatever MySQL instance you may have or MySQL cluster may be behind it. Uh, in terms of why you would use it, again, it's one of those, if you're, if you're WordPress.com, if you're automatic, it's very obvious why you use it because you have a lot of people using WordPress. Uh, if you're CNN, maybe if you're you know, one of these large high traffic vo or high volume sites, there may be very good reasons why you would need to have multiple so, databases. I, I, maybe I misphrased my question. It was more like technically why would you use it, uh, to, to take advantage of the things that my, I mean, WordPress out of the box is extremely simple, right? It's saying, okay, here's my, it's using MySQL, but it's kind of using it in a SQL light sort of way. I mean, it doesn't take advantage of a lot of the really advanced, not quite, but it's, it's not taking advantage of a lot of the things that MySQL can do out of the box, like replication, partitioning, failover, et cetera. Well, not failover, but it doesn't, it doesn't really leverage any of the things that make MySQL really actually good at what it does. Keep in mind, I mean, you guys know what Facebook is built on, right? It's MySQL. So can MySQL do a lot of things? Absolutely, if you, you know, take advantage of it and really use it the way it's supposed to be used. HyperDB is a way to modify the default, you know, WordPress interaction with MySQL so that you're actually taking advantage of all this really cool stuff that MySQL can do. Cool if you're a DBA. Uh, there was a question over here, and then I saw your question. It was, it was more of a comment question. One of the one of the use cases that I got into WordPress for was mm -hmm. was when you've got a, a web app that needs a published front end. Mm -hmm. So you've got all this you know, I built a, a, a custom plugin that processes all this boatload of data. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that many people hitting the the website, but and I'll just put one up, let's say it's an inventory system for a massive e-commerce. Yep. Solution. So, got these custom tables. We're going to be running all sorts of reports. Hey, we got 100 people hitting them. Sure. 
in the site. But so one of the reasons why, why you would take advantage of HyperDB, for example, is that there's things happening behind the scenes, be it uh, mostly at the plugin level, like your e-commerce settings, or perhaps BuddyPress, for example, or BBPress, membership settings, et cetera, that are extremely database. I, I absolutely agree with that statement. Because to me, and that was actually why I came to this, we, we call it going deep and wide. Do we, mm -hmm. do we buy more hardware? Or do we, or do we well, and yeah, so the so the question that's you know been around for years as long as system admins and DBAs have been around is, do you buy a bigger box or do you buy more boxes? Right. And HyperDB is one way that you can buy. I mean, it's believe me, it's not an actually easy thing to you know split MySQL into you know twenty different servers. Uh, it's a relational database. Relational as in math, like this is relational theory. You start breaking that mathematics pretty quickly if you start splitting these servers up. I mean, the, the secret sauce in MongoDB sharding, it leads to a lot of unintended con consequences if you don't understand what you're dealing with. Uh, I'm not actually a huge fan of partitioning, by the way. It's, it's one of those, I'd much rather go to nice NoSQL. If you haven't already figured that out by now, it's the second people start saying partitioning, I start leaving SQL land. Um, but yes, it, I think a very good use case, in fact, is Suppose I've got an e-commerce site. Suppose I've got a forum, a buddy press, something like that, a membership site. Um, it's not at all impossible or even unlikely that I would have a lot of people beating up the database. And just being able to split that load on the back end uh, makes a big difference. I mean, it really, really can make a huge difference for you. So definitely the plug. And by the way, that's actually uh, that's kind of a pet peeve for me. I mean. I really am tired of seeing social media icon plugins. Like we don't need any more of them. It's just, you know, build me a plugin that lets me manage a stock portfolio. Build me a plugin that like allows me to check in somewhere. I mean, I've, are, are you guys familiar with AppPressor at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's literally you can run um, WordPress websites as applications on an iPhone, for example. I believe it's an Android as well. This really kind of uh, to the extent that WordPress can take advantage of these cutting edge technologies, I think actually understanding, not necessarily like because you want to go out and be a DBA because it's so much fun, uh, but you should understand a lot of the things that are going on behind the scenes. And that way when somebody asks you, hey, well, can we, can we turn WordPress into a portfolio management system? Can we write a plugin for that? Well, yes, it's just PHP, MySQL, big deal. What do we need to think about? Hardware how much we're hammering the, the database, how many writes we're making concurrently, and so forth. So that's kind of my bigger hope, and, and why I hope this, you know, what, what I'm hoping you come away with is, hmm, there's probably a lot of things that we could do with WordPress, but they're gonna involve a little bit more work on the database side, I think. Uh, you had a question, and then you had a question. So since you're a huge, a huge fan of partitioning. Um, yes, I love <laughs> partitioning. You talked about, you know, large multi-site, kind of scalable multi-site. Mm -hmm. Um, if you do go down the path of partitioning your databases, mm -hmm. would it be more efficient to have that on one kind of powerful machine with multiple databases on there, or kind of getting cheaper DPSs and kind of spreading that out across multiple? Now, obviously, you have the maintenance of the multiple machines versus I/O. So, stuff. so the question in a nutshell is: if you have to partition your data, um, what's the best strategy in order to do so? Uh, do you do you use lots of machines, lots of little machines, a fleet of them, perhaps? Uh, or do you use you know, smaller but more powerful machines? The, the problem with partitioning is there is actually no one correct answer to that question. And that kind of goes back again to what your goal with partitioning should be is to treat each, you basically want each server to be its own little universe. If you can, get, if you can partition your data in a way that server A doesn't technically need to be aware of the data on server B or on server C or on server D, your partitioning, you know, the, the effect of partitioning your data is actually going to be very minimal. And in, in the extreme, let's suppose that instead of partitioning my data, say I'm partitioning the user table, instead of saying S's, T's, U's, V's, I take an MD5 hash, right? And based on the content of that MD5 hash, I say you go here, you go here, you go here, you go here, et cetera. I'll get consistent hashing, relatively consistent hashing, using something like an MD5 or a CRC32 to spread my data around the cluster. As long as everything that I'm spreading around the cluster is contained, like if all of my, you know, these four guys live in their own little universe on this server, and these four guys are on their own little universe on their own little server, it doesn't matter. You can have 100 VPSs, you can have two really powerful servers. Uh, that being said, I think that one of the biggest technical challenges is getting to that little island, 
you know, scenario where you're in your own little universe, a lot of times you are going to have to go with better hardware. You're going to need to keep all of my posts on all of my databases and then some of the user records, for example. You run into those sorts of situations a lot. An, an example would be membership. You would probably need to, you would probably want to put all of the membership content on all of the different sites. That way you're not dealing with na uh, network latency. The bigger point, I guess, there is it depends. There's no one answer to that. You know, do I do more? Do I do fewer? It's you are going to have a very long day. It's basically the best I can tell you. It's not an easy decision to make. Uh, and it's one that people tend to make correctly, even incorrectly, even if they know exactly what they're doing and exactly what trade-offs they're dealing with. Uh, because it's really hard to predict the evolution of how a technology is being used. Uh, and it's, it goes wrong a lot. So there is no good answer to that. I apologize. You have a question. I see another question back here. Sure. Have you ever seen a case where you would do something like partition your database for a reason other than performance? Absolutely. So have, have you ever seen a, uh, a good case, a good use case for partitioning your data set? Sure. So maybe you have two companies and they form a partnership. So they each have their own existing oh. data sets, but maybe there's something they want to share. I actually misunderstood your question. Just wasn't thinking when I heard your original question. Have I seen a good use case for partitioning your data that's not related to performance? Which isn't, by the way, related to performance. It's related to keeping the machine breathing. You run out of space. So you have to partition. Uh, or you run out of connection limits. You know, It's not like I'm trying to increase my throughput. <laughs> sure. It's I'm trying to stay above water. Right. Um, no, actually, I, I, I really have a hard time. Uh, you know, for the, you mentioned the example. What if I'm dealing with like a two companies merging together? Uh, would they maybe partition their data? I, I guess maybe. But I mean, if I were the DBA on that project, I'd say use different databases, guys. Why do you need to share that? Mm -hmm. uh, if that were really a concern, like oh, well, we need to share credentials, use an API. Mm -hmm. I, I would not lean that direction. I would. I don't know of any good reasons to do so. Okay. So um, Amazon RDS or running MySQL on an EC2? Am I, so the question is, do you use Amazon RDS or Amazon EC2? I don't know if I can, like, if part of my speaker protocol allows me to answer questions like that. I can talk to you about that afterwards. I definitely have an opinion about it. But I'm not sure if I can officially on the record say, use this one, not this one. I don't know. I, does anyone here know if I can answer that question? It'll be tweeted. It'll be tweeted. <laughs> Whatever you say, we'll be tweeted. The entire world will know. Exactly. And then I'll get a phone call from Amazon. You're on the record. You're on the record. Exactly. And I'll get a phone call from Amazon, you know, saying cease and desist, you owe us thirty thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a risk you're gonna have to take. Uh, I'm not gonna answer the question, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Um, you're still using Amazon services. So like if you have to put your money into one bucket or the other Amazon, where would it go? Into Amazon. In Amazon. <laughs> It, it again depends. Uh, I don't have a tremendously, I think you can do a lot better with EC2. Uh, there are certainly some cases where um, RDS has a lot of great use cases. Uh, one of them is you know, we're moving to a NoSQL shop, but we're not quite ready to throw all our billing data into Cassandra and hope for the best. Um, so we need a MySQL cluster that we can kind of set up and fire and forget. And that's exactly what we're in the middle of right now at my company is we're Losing, using less and less SQL and more and more NoSQL, but we still want our billing data in you know, Postgres because we care about asset compliance and so forth. Uh, and those sort of fire and forget, don't really want to tweak it, don't really want to get a whole lot of, out of it. RDS can be a very good deal. Um, that being said, I believe all RDS storage is EBS based, I think. Uh, and that's, you know, EBS has an interesting track record. So that's, um, Certainly a lot of network latency, a lot of noise. Uh, I can't say for sure, like, you know, definitely use EC2, definitely use RDS, but more, more use cases than not, I'd probably lean towards EC2. Yeah? So, uh, this API, mm -hmm. so WPDB or WQuery, so how, mm -hmm. do you do, how do we close a connection and... The WordPress, how do you close a connection? The so WordPress so database the API question. will close the connection for you. Exactly. The WordPress database API will close the connections for you. I mean, it's very well written. Okay. Uh, where you start running into problems are where developers don't know the API, for example, and they're just like, I'm just going to write some SQL. And when you say just write some SQL, I assume you're referring to not using WPDB, but instead actually using um, the MySQLite uh, command? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
and that happens. So the question is, are you, am I referring to people who you know basically do it the wrong way? They don't use WBDB, or they use they, what's that? I've never seen it happen, <laughs> ever. No, I mean basically, uh, and, and this is know your tools. Know, you know you're, you know what the, w, the the WordPress database API is. It's pretty well written. Uh, I'm, there probably are some edge cases that wouldn't terminate a connection. There may not be. I actually don't know. But the instances where that I've seen it, where connections aren't being closed, it's because some guy just you know okay. wrote was, a PDO and started was, firing off database was, queries. Those words that I was sitting there going, I can't believe I'm not doing this, but I'm saying I you probably are. Third question. Yep. Third time's a charm. You were late. What was your What was your preferred talk? Uh, my preferred talk was. Uh, <laughs> So you guys are getting in all kinds of trouble. You know, EC2 versus uh, RDS. I've probably got an email from Amazon right now. Um, the uh, WordPress under the hood. So I was basically not even trying to try to do a developer talk today. I was going to try to talk to intro developers or intro you know, designers, for example, about, okay, guys, what's functions PHP again? What's a core functionality plugin? Sort of raise the bar in terms of these best practices. And uh, if, if it's not, I mean, again, if, this is a fairly boring topic. Uh, it's an important one, but I think it's a very boring one. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm hoping everyone comes away with is there are best practices, and there's a, there's a lot of technology here in the stack. I mean, PHP alone is a very big animal, right? It's a very big and complicated piece of software if you really invest in it. Uh, likewise, MySQL, DBAs exist for a reason, uh, HTML, CSS, et cetera. Uh, try to, something that I've noticed a lot with WordPress developers is the number of people who don't know any other languages, you know? Go learn Python, go learn Java, go learn something else, just because it will actually make you think about all of the code that you're writing a little bit differently, usually in a good way. Um, I'm a huge advocate of that, and that's, I think, if, if I can get two takeaways from my talk, one is look into your database a little bit, think about what can I write plugin-wise that's not you know, another social media icon, uh, and then two, learn something that has absolutely nothing to do with WordPress, code-related. You'll probably come away a much better WordPress developer for it. So, I don't know if I'm out of time or not. I'm certainly boring. I apologize for that. Yes, you have another question. So you mentioned that plugin developers don't write good queries. I can't. Uh, I mentioned that plugin developers don't write good queries. None of them do. Period. There's no. <laughs> I can't make a broad sweeping generalization like none of them ever. Is there a lot of bad SQL out there? Yeah. So what resource? The WordPress Codex and the, the database API is really good. If you just follow the recommendations of the WordPress Codex on that topic, you will not go wrong. At least if, if you will, I'm not aware of how. That's kind of a boring answer too, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> You're like, man, that's boring. A lot of people don't do it. Basically, they, they, they just take PHP and they do a PDO prompts and go into the WordPress API. People don't use the codex like they should. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying just use a different Absolutely. Uh, base, if, you, if you're writing queries the way that Word, the WordPress Codex says you should, you're not the one creating problems. It's the guy that writes a PDO function and starts just you know, randomly submitting SQL queries, which may or may not be you know, subjective. Sometimes they don't even write a PDO. Sometimes it's just like this giant gaping SQL injection attack waiting to happen. There's a lot of stuff out there. So, so can you go to the place on WordPress? That has what you're talking about. Absolutely. I'm there and I'm not sure. Now you guys are going to take it out on me, right? Like, yeah. show me where it says that. Exactly. Payback. Exactly. Hang on a second. <laughs> Does anyone else have internet? Yeah, but it's, it cuts out constantly. Oh, yeah, I'm kind of like I can't even find my Wi-Fi icon right now. Um, sir, if I will find you after this uh, after this talk, and once I have internet, or I'll find it on my phone or something like that. But are there any other questions? Not so much. Well, thank you very much for your time. Sorry for being boring.